ऑप्शन से गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन एंड वेलकम I call this December 17th, 2020 meeting of the NCRA board to order. I want to note for the record that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, today's meeting is open to the public via a live webcast only. The public may access the meeting by visiting the agency's homepage and clicking on the provided webcast link. I'd also like to note that all participants in today's webcast meeting are participating remotely. So if we experience any technical difficulties, I ask for your patience in advance. Before we begin, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome our newest board member, Cal Hoffman. I welcome him to the NCRA board today as this is indeed his first meeting. I had the pleasure of swearing Cal in earlier this week as well. Prior to joining the NCRA board, Mr. Hoffman served as Senator Tom Cotton's advisor on economic policy, as well as staff director of the Senate Banking Committee's subcommittee on economic policy. Previously, Mr. Hoffman held the position of executive director of the Main Street Growth Project and senior vice president at Jefferies and Co. He worked at Lehman Brothers as a bond trader in New York City, as well as in their international offices in Tokyo and Sydney and served as a voting member of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission's Advisory Committee on Small and Emerging Companies. Mr. Hoffman holds a master's degree in business administration from Columbia Business School and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of California at Los Angeles. Mr. Hoffman brings practical, real-world experiences about the, the, the delicate balance of working in a re regulated entity and recognizing the impact that regulations play, he will bring a market-focused discipline to his work here at the NCUA. In addition, he clearly has demonstrated in his career both in the financial services sector and working for Senator Cotton that incentives need to be aligned appropriately to drive good performance. Mr. Haltman, welcome, sir. I'd now like to invite you to make any introductory comments you'd like to make uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll be brief. I just want to say uh, thank you for that warm welcome. I want to thank everybody at NCUA for the warm welcome. Uh, we definitely live in interesting times, uh, and I look forward to when we can do these in person. I can get to know the other members of this world-class organization even better. Uh, thank you as well to Board Member Harbor for his warm welcome. And <clears throat> I know we're going to accomplish a lot together, and I think we all have the right attitude to uh, get things done for America's credit union members. Thank you, sir. Yes, and Mr. Haltman, I couldn't agree with you more. We're getting things done on behalf of the one-third of Americans who rely on their credit unions each and every day. I'd like to acknowledge and thank you as well, sir, for your tenacity and temerity that you demonstrated while we waited to get you across the finish line. I'm delighted that we were able to work with both sides of the aisle in getting you all of the necessary support you needed to join us here today. So with that, again, welcome. I'd now like to offer board member Harper an opportunity to welcome our newest board member. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I also join you in welcoming our new colleague, Kyle Hoffman, to the NCUA board. He brings with him a distinguished record of legislating, policymaking, and real world financial services experiences. His professional insights and personal experiences will also bring a fresh perspective to the agency's operations rulemaking, and priorities. <clears throat> board member Hoffman has joined the NCUA board at an important moment. Managing the economic fallout of the pandemic is a shared priority of ours. In responding to the pandemic's economic effects, we will likely need to make some tough decisions about how best to protect members, federally insured credit unions, and taxpayers. In these deliberations, the merits of the best policy should guide our decisions, and I hope allow us to reach consensus more often than not on the issues. The NCUA board works best when we consider and address the views of everyone. I also look forward to learning more about board member Hoffman's approach on how to expand the role of technology at credit unions to further economic equality, justice, and inclusion. This is important work. Another commonality between the two of us is our work for lawmakers and Congress, albeit in different chambers which has shaped board member Hoffman and me. 
Thus, I think he will appreciate the guidance engraved in marble above the speaker's desk on the House floor. Given by Daniel Webster, that advice reads, let us develop the resources of our land, call forth its powers, build up its institutions, promote all of its great interests, and see whether we also, in our day and generation, may not perform something worthy to be remembered. That is exactly what we should strive to do together. Let us, in a good way now, perform something worthy to be remembered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to today's proceedings. Thank you, Mr. Harper. We have a very robust agenda today, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to begin. The first item on our agenda is Proposed Rule Part 701, Appendix B, Field of Membership, Shared Facility Requirements. Staff presenting, Elizabeth Warwick, Senior Staff Attorney from the Office of the General Counsel. Good morning and welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. And good morning, Board Member Harper, and welcome, Board Member Hupman. The NCRA's Chartering and Field of Membership Manual implements the FCUX requirement that multiple common bond federal credit unions may only add groups that are within reasonable proximity to the credit union and underserved areas where the credit union has an office or facility. Over time, the NCUA has adapted the requirements for a service facility based on experience with the chartering manual. Today's proposed rule simplifies and streamlines the prerequisites for service facilities. Currently, the term service facility is defined three times in the chartering manual, but each version of the definition is slightly different. For example, an ATM is a service facility for purposes of multiple group additions, but not for underserved area additions. For multiple group additions, a service facility must offer at least one of several services, while for underserved area additions, it must offer all of the listed services. The proposed rule would conform these definitions, making the definition the same for additions of either groups or underserved areas. A separate section of the proposal also revisits the question of whether credit union websites and mobile applications should count as service facilities and asks for comments on this subject but the board is not proposing rule language at this time. I look forward to any questions. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your presentation this morning, Elizabeth. It's really informative. Today's proposed rule would revise the definitions of service facility in the NCUA's Chartering and Field of Membership Manual. Today's action is good public policy and will allow individuals greater access to affordable financial products and services, especially in underserved and low-income areas. Currently, credit unions that contractually participate in shared branching without an ownership interest are unable to extend service to an employee group or association that is located within reasonable proximity to a shared branching location, while a credit union with an ownership interest in the very same shared branching network is authorized to do so. And since it can be cost prohibitive to buy an ownership interest in shared branching, this only hurts smaller credit unions who are often at the front lines of helping low to moderate income consumers, marginalized consumers at that. So this really has hurt them in the past. The proposed rule also allows an ATM to qualify as a service facility for the addition of underserved areas. Credit unions will still have to develop respective plans to serve these areas, but this change means that more federal credit unions will be able to serve underserved communities. In many cases, I believe this rule will help credit unions be able to expand into underserved areas with ATMs that are in close proximity to their existing physical branch locations. But more access in underserved areas is indeed a very good thing. Removing barriers so that federal credit unions can serve additional members has also been a key part of my focus on financial inclusion and shared prosperity. And these are changes that really should have happened a long time ago. Nothing in the statute prohibits us from making these changes. In addition to proposing changes to the definition of service facility, the board is also requesting comment about whether it is time to consider other changes to the definition of a service facility as the Act does not define what one really is. Specifically, we're asking for comments about whether it's now time to include a credit union's website or mobile app in the definition of service facility. 
While the board did not move forward with adopting such a change four years ago, despite issuing a proposed regulation and seeking public comment, the board mentioned a desire to continue and study this issue. While this rule is indeed a good start, I actually wish we were going further to consider other technological advances. The pandemic has changed the way we do business. In fact, today's board meeting is being conducted virtually. So these technological advances are not new or novel for the board to consider. The reality is that consumers are moving more and more to digital banking, and we should be considering that many credit union members consider mobile apps to be their respective credit union. I've heard from many young members who never step foot in their credit unions. Virtually, their banking is all done digitally. So I do hope we can do more in this rule in the future, and I hope, especially before my term ends in August of 2023, we will have made great inroads in bringing a lot of these types of activities to fruition. Elizabeth, I do have just one question for you. Can you please state for the record the NCUA's progression towards video telemachines and how we got there? Can we view today's board action as a natural progression of technology and how member owners can be served similar to what the agency did with video telemachines? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, in 2012, um, NCUA's Office of General Counsel issued an opinion letter that clarified that video telemachines meeting certain requirements would be deemed service facilities for purposes of both group and underserved area additions. Um, some of those requirements included that the video teller be staffed by local employees, have real-time contact, and offer all of the services available at other locations. Um, executive branch agencies such as NCUA are charged with implementing federal laws such as the Federal Credit Union Act, and that responsibility includes examining when updates to implementing regulations might be appropriate in light of technical advances. As technology and consumer usage patterns evolve, the NCUA will likely continue to consider appropriate amendments to its field of membership regulations. Thank you. Thank you. I have no further questions. I'd now like to recognize Board Member Harper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Elizabeth. It's always great to hear your voice. And your presentation on this proposed rule to expand the field of membership requirements for multiple common bond credit unions and the request for comment on whether a credit union's website and mobile banking applications should be considered a service facility are the issues we are considering today. Although I support expanding access to affordable financial services for people of modest means and with diverse backgrounds, I cannot support this proposal. In my view, this proposed rule and request for comment do not conform with either the letter or the spirit of the Federal Credit Union Act. One of the Act's several requirements for adding a group to a multiple common bond federal credit union is that the credit union must be, quote, within reasonable proximity to the location of the group whenever practicable and consistent with reasonable standards for the safe and sound operation of the credit union, unquote. The chartering manual interprets the term reasonable proximity as requiring the group to be within the reasonable geographic proximity of the credit union. The chartering manual then explains this means that the group must be within the service area of one of the credit union service facilities. Among the Act's requirements for adding an underserved area to a multiple common bond federal credit union is that the credit union establishes and maintains an office or facility in the underserved area. The chartering manual implements this provision of, of the act by requiring a credit union adding an underserved area to its field of membership to establish within two years and maintain an office or service facility in the community. Under this proposal, the service facility includes a shared branch or a shared branch network location, including a shared ATM or other electronic facility if a credit union participates in a shared branching program network, while removing the ownership requirement. I do not find that a leased ATM, among other proposed structures, creates a sufficient field of membership nexus under the Federal Credit Union Act. What is more, 
a leased ATM would not serve the needs of an underserved community well. Many of the residents of these communities often prefer and need more personalized service. This proposal also requests comment on whether a credit union's transactional website and mobile banking applications should be included in the definition of a service facility. The agency first considered this issue in 2015 and opted not to move forward. Construing reasonable proximity to include internet access could render the Federal Credit Unions Act requirement a near nullity. Because the internet is widely available, this broader interpretation would allow field of membership expansion, subject to safety and soundness, to anywhere except rural or remote areas without internet access or wireless service. I do not believe that this is what the Congress envisioned, and I do not believe that credit union members will be well served by this approach. Finally, I do not support the 30-day comment period for this proposed rule or any of the other proposals that we are, will consider today. The legal and public policy issues raised by this proposal and the others are too important and fairness dictates that the agency affords stakeholders ample time to provide their views. That is even more true while we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Given my concerns about the legal underpinnings of this rule, I will oppose issuing this proposal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further comments. Thank you, Board Member Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member Hoffman. I have uh, no questions or comments at this time, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you. And I would just want to thank our general counsel and their team for letting us recognize that, yes, this does comply with the statute. I'd also recognize that when the act was written in the 1930s, I dare say that a lot of those individuals could not envision us being able to embrace today's video tellers, ATM network, or any of the other services that we're using now uh, for our 21st century institutions. With that being said, I'd like to ask if there is a motion. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, I move that the board approve proposed rule, part 701, appendix B of NCUA's rules and regulations for a 30-day comment period as attached to the board action memorandum. Is there a second to the motion? Hearing none, I second the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Nay. Thank you. The ayes have it and let the record show the motion pass two to one. Thank you again, Elizabeth, for presenting this morning. The second item on our agenda today is temporary final rule part 701, regulatory relief in response to COVID-19. Staff presenting, Myra Tepe, Director, Office of Examination and Insurance, and Thomas Zells, Staff Attorney, Office of the General Counsel. Good morning, Myra and Thomas. Good morning. Good morning, morning. Chairman Hood, Board Member Harper, and Board Member Hopman. Tom Zells and I are here today to request your approval to extend the regulatory relief the NCUA Board granted in April of 2020 in 12 CFR Part 701, Temporary Re Regulatory Relief in Response to COVID-19. The temporary rule modified certain regulatory requirements to help ensure that federally insured credit unions could remain operational and properly conduct appropriate liquidity management to address economic conditions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. In April, the board concluded that the following amendments would provide federally insured credit unions necessary additional flexibility in a manner consistent with the NCUA's responsibility to maintain safety and soundness of the credit union system. First, the NCUA Board expanded federally insured credit unions' authority to purchase loans and participations in loans. The Board temporarily raised the maximum aggregate amount of loan participations a federally insured credit union may purchase from a single originated lender to the greater of $5 million or 200% of the federally insured credit union's net worth. Second, the Board also temporarily suspended certain limitations on the types of eligible obligations a, federally, a federal credit union may purchase and hold. And third, the amendment told the required timeframes for the occupancy or disposition of properties a federal credit union is not currently using 
or has abandoned, addressing the impact of various physical distancing practices necessitated by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the interest of providing timely regulatory relief and to address real operational and liquidity concerns, the NCUA board found it had good cause to not seek comment on the temporary final rule, which became effective April 16th of 2020. Without approval to extend the provisions, this temporary rule will expire on December 31st of 2020. As you are aware, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to create uncertainty for federally insured credit unions and their members. In response, the board has continued to work with federal and state regulatory agencies and to invite feedback from credit unions to identify ways in which the agency can assist federally insured credit unions in managing their operations. Due to the ongoing nature of the pandemic, and its impact on federally insured credit unions and their members, it is necessary to extend the effectiveness of these temporary Part 701 provisions. The economic environment is a key determinant of credit union performance. The economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic may result in additional stress on credit union balance sheets, potentially requiring strong liquidity management over the course of 2021. The NCUA, like credit unions, needs to plan and prepare for a range of economic outcomes that could affect credit union performance. This includes establishing a regulatory environment that provides federally insured credit unions the flexibility to cope with and address the range of potential COVID-19 impacts. With this analysis in mind, we recommend extending the temporary Part 701 amendments through the end of calendar year 2021. Further, for the same reasons, we believe the board has good cause to make the extension of the amendments effective immediately and without solicitation of public comment to ensure that current temporary relief does not lapse and potentially harm federally insured credit unions' ability to manage and address the impacts of COVID-19. This concludes my remarks. Tom and I are happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mara, and thank you, Tom, as well. Thank you both for bringing this matter to the Board for Action. I'm indeed proud of the work the agency has done to provide regulatory relief and support credit unions' safe and sound operations during this unprecedented and challenging time, and believe that extending such relief is prudent so long as it does not place the credit union share insurance fund at risk. I have just one question on this item. Have how have credit unions benefited from the regulatory relief granted in April of 2020 of this year? Hi, Chairman. This is Myra Tepe again. While it's difficult to specifically quantify the relief, I can say that call report data indicates that loan participation purchase activity for all federally insured credit unions has increased through September 30th of 2020 compared to the same period of the previous year. Um, it looks like nearly 50% of this increased activity was generated in the third quarter. This is the first full quarter after the original regulatory relief was provided. Um, sir, we believe the regulatory relief contributed to these increases. Um, I also believe that it's reasonable to assume these relief provisions helped federally insured credit unions manage liquidity by allowing expanded purchases and sales between credit unions. This concludes my response. Great. Thank you, Mara. And that is an area I certainly look forward to continuing to monitor with you and your team. I have no further questions. I'd now like to recognize Board Member Harper. The floor is yours, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Myra, for your presentation and Tom for being available to assist at the board um, in answering questions. And thank you to everyone who has worked on this COVID-19 regulatory relief temporary rule during the past nine months. In April, as our country was just beginning to grapple with the economic impact of the pandemic, the NCUA board temporarily amended three regulatory requirements to ensure that federally insured credit unions remained operational and liquid through the duration of the pandemic. Specifically, the temporary final rule raised the maximum aggregate amount of loan participation that a federally insured credit union may purchase from a single our originating lender to the greater of $5 million or 200% of the federally insured credit union's net worth. The rule also suspended limits on the eligible obligations that a federal credit union may purchase and hold. Finally, due to physical distancing practices made necessary by COVID-19, the rule told the requirement timeframes for the occupancy or disposition of properties not being used for federal credit union business or that have been abandoned. 
These temporary amendments were to, were, were to remain in place through December 31st, 2020. I supported that temporary and targeted rule because it provided credit unions with a few more sensible short-term tools that they could use in the case of public a pandemic-induced liquidity or operational issues. At that time, none of us knew how long the pandemic and the related economic fallout would last. With vaccinations now beginning, we nevertheless know that the pandemic will last at least for several months more. In the best case scenario, forecasters predict that the economy will return to its pre-pandemic output level by late 2021, so it will take much longer for employment to recover. Because of the ongoing economic uncertainty and because of staff assurances that these changes are consistent with safety and soundness, I will follow their advice and support extending this targeted relief until December 31st, 2021. In supporting this temporary rule, I want to make clear that we would need to follow the normal rulemaking process of seeking public comment if we were to make any of these changes permanent. The information obtained in any such rulemaking may affect my future views on the advisability and merit of these matters. Before closing, I have one question for you, Myra. Several stakeholders have recently asked whether we will extend the interagency temporary appraisal deferral rule, which was also issued in April. That temporary standard, which expires on December 31st, allows credit unions to defer appraisals and written estimates of market value for a grace period of up to 120 days after loan closing for covered transactions. Will the NCUA be extending the interagency temporary appraisal deferral rule? If not, could you please explain why? Um, yes, this is Myra Teppi. So at this time, staff doesn't recommend extending um, the appraisal relief we previously um, provided. Um, in an effort to provide relief to borrowers, this rule was initially approved back in April due to widespread concerns of the health and safety of appraisers and customers. Um, since that time, numerous appraisal flexibilities have been put forth by the GSEs and other federal housing agencies um, have decreased health and safety concerns and reduced the delays that we saw in the early days of the pandemic. Um, the flexibilities also include clarification of the permissibility of desktop appraisals and exterior-only appraisals for certain real estate transactions. Um, also, I want to mention that in the appraisal rule, that the temporary rule that was um, approved by the board, um, we also have the relief actually does sort of extend into 2021. So a loan that closes December 31st of 2020 would still have 120 days to um, get the appraisal for the closing documents. I wanted to make sure that part was clear. Um, but we also have consulted with other banking agencies who've extended similar relief, and at this time, they're not recommending extension either. So we don't believe that recommending extending the rule past the J December 31st, 2020 expiration date is recommended at this time. That concludes my response. Myra, thank you very much for that analysis. Your explanation sounds sensible to me. Mr. Chairman, I have no further comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I have one question for Myra, and it's a little bit bigger picture. Uh, as we all know, it is possible that today, tomorrow, or maybe next week, there may be another congressional deal uh, per COVID relief. And the deal on the table includes $300 billion more in PPP funding. Obviously, a piece of that would be lent from credit unions. Can I just ask you, if a deal goes through with some amount of money, I don't know if it will be $300 billion, it could be zero, but if there is something, what is your thought on how that would impact liquidity concerns if money started going out the door with a fresh new batch of billions of dollars in PPP loans? Um, I think we would actually have to, um, again, take a look at it. There have been some changes to some of the regulations on the PPP, um, PPP loans that, um, for risk-based net worth and also on PPP loans pledged in the liquidity facility. So um, we would actually have to see how the impact would be on credit unions and how that money would flow in, depending on the timing in the first quarter. Um, that, might, that might also impact um, credit union balance sheets 
um, provide liquidity um, probably in the first couple quarters, depending on timing. So we'd actually have to go back and readdress that. But at the time of this um, recommendation, that bill had not passed, sir. So um, but we will go back and reconsider once that is um, complete. So I hope that um, answers your question. It sure did. Uh, yeah, and there obviously may not be a bill at all. Who knows? Um, but it would, if, it, if this deal does go through, it would impact liquidity with some portion of that $300 billion being done by credit unions. And I also want to commend uh, Chairman Hood and Board Member uh, Harper for dealing with the capital treatment of those PPB loans. That was such a key thing given the emergency nature uh, back when that started at uh, the first week of April. Had they not addressed uh, how those were treated, uh, both in capital standards and in other things, uh, credit unions would not have played the outstanding role they played in getting that money out to needed businesses. I have no further questions or comments, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you, Mr. Haltman, and I appreciate your recognition of the role that Board Member Harper and I did play in providing that relief around capital with PPP loans in terms of giving them the 0% risk weighting. I'd like to also commend the credit union system for the role they played in using the PPP program so successfully. As I mentioned in one of my recent um, congressional hearings, credit unions provided over 171,000 PPP loans for an aggregate amount of about $8.6 billion. They were getting those loans out to those small business owners that really needed them to keep their doors open. So I, too, applaud credit unions for the role they played in actively supporting that program. I'd now like to ask if there is a motion. Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is Board Member Harper. I move that the Board approve the extension of temporary final rule, Part 701 of NCUA's rules and regulations as attached to the Board Action Memorandum. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? I second the motion. There is a sufficient second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The ayes have it and let the record show the motion pass three to zero. The third item on our agenda today is proposed rule parts 703 and 721 or 721, mortgage servicing rights. Staff presenting Rick Mayfield, Senior Capital Market Specialist and Lou Pham, Senior Credit Specialist, Office of Examination and Insurance, and Ian Marina, Associate General Counsel, Office of General Counsel. Welcome to all of you, Rick, Lou, and Ian. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Hood. Good morning, Board Member Harper, and good morning, Board Member Hoffman. We are here to present a notice of proposed rulemaking to allow federal credit unions to purchase mortgage servicing rights or MSRs from other federally insured credit unions as permissible investments under 12 CFR Part 703. Just for background information, mortgage servicing rights are assets that arise from contractual agreements whereby the servicer receives a fee from the owner of the mortgage loan for performing loan servicing functions, such as collecting payments from borrowers and remitting those payments to investors, collecting and remitting escrow payments, managing delinquencies, and handling foreclosures. NCUA's investment rule has prohibited federal credit unions from purchasing MSRs since 1997, and the board has retained this regulatory prohibition over the years due to safety and soundness concerns regarding investments in MSRs. However, we believe the time is appropriate to lift this prohibition in a manner that is consistent with safety and soundness. Federal credit unions and credit unions in general have longstanding experience making and servicing residential mortgage loans. In fact, residential mortgage loans is the single largest category of loans across the system, accounting for over one-third of all credit union loans. And credit unions continue to originate substantial amounts of residential mortgage loans each year. In many cases, credit unions or their QSOs service these mortgage loans, some of which have been sold to investors, which requires, among other things, knowledgeable staff, adequate management information systems, and expertise in consumer protection laws. One of the primary complexities associated with MSRs involves their evaluation for accounting and reporting purposes. However, we know that credit unions have been reporting the value of their MSRs on the call report since 2003. MSRs for federal credit unions are primarily derived when a federal credit union originates a residential mortgage loan and then sells it to investors but retains the servicing. 
According to the latest call report, federally insured credit unions hold 1.9 billion in MSRs, with federal credit unions holding 1.1 billion of this amount. Credit unions have various tools available to value MSRs, including valuation models, whether in-house or developed by third parties, and market expertise from accounting and valuation firms. We believe lifting the current prohibition makes sense given credit unions' experience making and servicing residential mortgage loans. They have market resources available to them to help with valuing MSRs, which is one of the more challenging aspects of MSRs. More importantly, allowing federal credit unions to purchase MSRs will provide them the flexibility to operate their mortgage servicing business in a way that fits their strategic objectives. Lifting this prohibition could allow certain credit union servicers to scale up their operations and likewise allow some servicers to exit the business, whether it's because of inefficiencies or for other strategic reasons. This provides federally insured credit unions another avenue to sell their servicing assets while keeping the servicing of these loans in the credit union system. We recognize that MSRs have certain inherent risks that could adversely affect the credit union's financial condition. Therefore, the proposed rule requests that commenters provide feedback on several questions regarding safety and soundness standards that may ultimately become preconditions for purchasing MSRs in a final rule. Questions in the proposed rule range from whether the rule should establish threshold CAMEL ratings for eligible credit unions to whether the rule should include concentration limits on MSR purchases. We believe the current prohibition is outdated and does not reflect credit unions' history and experience making and servicing residential mortgage loans. Lifting this prohibition will allow federal credit unions the flexibility to operate their mortgage loan servicing business in a manner that fits their strategic objectives. It will provide federally insured credit unions another channel to sell their MSRs. For these reasons, we request approval of the proposed rule. Thank you. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. And thank you for your presentation. Federal credit unions have come a long way since the NCUA created the prohibition on investing in mortgage servicing rights. The industry size, complexity, and most importantly, its sophistication have all grown tremendously since then. As you mentioned in your remarks, originating and servicing residential mortgage loans is an important activity for many credit unions. Many of them already service loans that have been sold to investors. The time has indeed come for NCUA to permit federal credit unions to purchase mortgage servicing rights from other federally insured credit unions. The ability to do this will provide flexibility for federal credit unions to manage their mortgage servicing lines of business and create liquidity in the credit union system, while also providing a more diverse business and investment opportunity for purchasers of mortgage servicing rights. Both sellers and purchasers of mortgage servicing rights can benefit from this proposed rule, and we, and we consider this appropriate regulatory relief for federal credit unions and the rest of the credit union system. I have no questions on this matter, but just to thank you all for your hard work. I know this was a Herculean task with all the work that went into it, and thank you all for getting everything ready for today's board deliberation. I'd now like to recognize board member Harper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Lou, for your presentation, and Rick and Ian for your hard work on this rule. I greatly appreciate all of the staff time spent on this proposed rule to allow federal credit unions to purchase mortgage servicing rights from another federally insured credit union. That said, I must oppose the rulemaking at this time because this proposal puts the cart before the horse. We should have incorporated important guardrails into the base proposal. We should have also ensured that we have an effective compliance program in place to monitor the compliance risk at those federal credit unions that purchase mortgage servicing rights. There are many risks associated with mortgage servicing, interest rate risk, price risk, compliance risk, operational risk, liquidity risk, concentration risk, reputational risk, default risk, and legal risk, just to name a few. In fact, the text of this proposed rule details how mortgage servicing rights have certain inherent attributes that can have an impact on a federal credit union's financial condition. Specifically, the mortgage servicing rights can carry operational risks due to a multitude of statutes and regulations 
to protect consumers, which can expose federal credit unions to reputational, legal, and compliance risk. In addition, mortgage servicing rights can expose servicers to liquidity risk as certain mortgage loans that have been sold to investors require the servicer to remit payments to the investors even if borrowers do not make the monthly mortgage loan payments. And the value of mortgage servicing rights is highly dependent on prevailing interest rates. In a rapidly increasing or decreasing rate environment, this can introduce extreme volatility to a credit union's financial condition as the rights are periodically valued for accounting and reporting purposes. A federal credit union in poor financial condition may be unable to withstand the financial impact of a significant loss due to a write down in the value of its mortgage servicing rights, especially if the credit union were highly concentrated in the business line. That is why the yet to be implemented risk-based capital rule imposes a 250% risk weight on mortgage servicing rights. Rather than substantively addressing any of these risks, the proposed rule merely asks a series of questions. In my view, those questions should have been asked and answered as part of an earlier stage in the rulemaking process. As a result, this proposed rule is just half-baked. The proposed rule should have instead included substantial guardrails. One of the many lessons we should have learned from the Great Recession and the ensuing foreclosure crisis is that mortgage servicing is a complex and risk-laden business that not only impacts safety and soundness, but also consumers. Because I feel that the NCUA needs a stronger consumer compliance program, I am especially concerned about allowing federal credit unions to take on more risk without providing safeguards to manage the compliance issues and without having an effective NCUA compliance program to supervise that risk. Think about the enforcement action one of our sister agencies brought earlier this month against a national mortgage servicer for engaging in unfair and deceptive acts and practices in violation of a number of consumer financial protection laws. That servicer, quote, failed to identify loans on its system that had pending loss mitigation applications or trial modification plans, and as a result, failed to honor borrowers' loan modification agreements. They also foreclosed on borrowers to whom it had promised it would not foreclose while their loss mitigation applications were pending. These violations of law caused families to lose their homes and undercut their financial stability, potentially putting people at risk without having a sufficient consumer compliance supervisory program in place is the last thing the NCUA should be expediting during the COVID-19 pandemic with so many people teetering on the edge. Finally, I am deeply concerned about mortgage servicing increasing liquidity risk for an institution. The NCUA has been working very hard throughout the pandemic to ensure that the credit union system has the tools it needs to ensure liquidity. This proposed rule without guardrails does nothing to bolster the credit union system from the COVID-19 related economic fallout. In fact, it does the opposite. It increases liquidity risk in the system. To me, that is a step in the wrong direction. In voting against this proposed rule, I am not necessarily signaling my opposition to moving ahead with a final rule. If the final rule contains appropriate guardrails to mitigate the inherent risks in mortgage servicing, I may find a way to support the final rule. Today, however, I must oppose this notice of proposed rulemaking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further comments. Thank you, Mr. Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member Hoffman. No comments at this time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Is there a motion? I move that the Board approve proposed rule, Part 703 and 721 of NCUA's Rules and Regulations, for a 30-day comment period as attached to the Board Action Memorandum. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? Hearing none, I second the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Nay. 
Thank you. The ayes have it, and let the record show the motion passed two to one. The fourth item on our agenda today is proposed rule part 701 overdraft policy. Staff presenting, Scott Neat, Associate Director, Allison Clark, Chief Accountant, Office of Examination and Insurance, Gira Bose, Staff Attorney, and Tom Zells, Staff Attorney from the Office of General Counsel. Good morning, all of you, and welcome. Good morning, Chairman Hood, Board Member Harper, and Board Member Hauptman. This is Ian Moreno, uh, also from the Office of General Counsel. Uh, we are here today to present a proposed rule on overdraft policies for federal credit unions. Uh, before Scott Need addresses the specifics of this recommended proposed rule, I would like to provide some background about how the NCUA has historically addressed overdrafts for federal credit unions. The agency first permitted federal credit unions to advance money to a member to cover his or her account deficit through an overdraft without having a credit application on file in the year 2000. The Federal Credit Union Act does not expressly address a federal credit union's authority to pay or honor a debit from a share account that will result in an overdrawn account. However, the NCUA's longstanding position has been that an overdraft as a financial accommodation to a member constitutes a loan or line of credit to a member. Uh, this activity would also be an incidental power to federal credit union general authority to accept payment on shares under the incidental powers test as established through case law and also in the NCUA's regulation at 12 CFR Part 721. In providing federal credit unions with this authority in the year 2000 rule, the NCUA adopted a regulatory requirement that in order for a federal credit union to advance money to a member to cover an account deficit without having a credit application from the borrower on file, the federal credit union must have a written overdraft policy that meets certain requirements. One of those particular requirements is that the federal credit union's written policy must establish a time limit not to exceed 45 calendar days for the member either to deposit funds to cover the overdraft or to obtain an approved loan from the federal credit union. I will now turn it over to Scott Dee to discuss the change that is being proposed to this particular requirement. Over to you, Scott. Thank you, Ian. This is Scott Neat, Associate Director in the Office of Examination and Insurance. Uh, as Ian was discussing, this proposed rule would modify the current requirement that a federal credit union's written overdraft policy establish a time limit not to exceed 45 calendar days for a member to either deposit funds or obtain an approved loan from the federal credit union to cover each overdraft. The pro proposed rule change would remove the 45-day maximum and replace it with a requirement that a federal credit union's written policy include a specific time limit that is both reasonable and applicable to all members for a member to either deposit funds or obtain an approved loan from the credit union to cover each overdraft. The proposed rule would also add language noting that, consistent with U.S. Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, or GAAP, Overdraft balances would generally be charged off when considered uncollectible. Regulation E sets forth other requirements applicable to certain overdraft service and was amended in 2009 after the adoption of the current rule. With this rule change, we are adding provision to make it clear that NCOA's rule does not supersede or alter the requirements outlined in Regulation E. Finally, we believe that this change will improve a regulatory requirement that is overly prescriptive and not beneficial. In addition, the current provision has made it difficult for credit unions, federal credit unions to make or to take steps to provide their members the flexibility needed to cope with the impacts of COVID-19. Chairman, that concludes our prepared remarks. We will be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Great. Thank you. The NCUA has led the way on rethinking and modifying burdensome and outdated rules that hamper economic recovery for the credit union industry. A case in point is this rule change that would adjust regulations governing federal credit unions' overdraft accounting policies. Like other financial services institutions, many credit unions offer optional overdraft protection programs for their member owners. If a participating member's account is overdrawn, the credit union will, for a nominal fee, cover the transaction. The member must then replenish the overdrawn account within 45 days, 
either by depositing funds or obtaining an approved loan from their credit union. In some cases, overdraft protection can serve as a form of short-term credit, offering credit union members greater peace of mind and flexibility in managing their daily finances. During these times of economic stress and uncertainty in particular, access to short-term credit can be especially helpful. For a working parent on a reduced income or a small business owner trying to keep her head above water until economic recovery begins, a quick source of affordable credit could help bridge the gap. Further, such access spares many credit union members from seeking financial relief from pernicious predatory payday lenders or higher interest rate credit cards. The current rule carries a strict not to exceed 45 calendar days timeline for member owners to replenish the funds. But under the proposed interim final rule change, that period would be extended to give credit unions more time and flexibility to explore solutions that better meet their members' needs. Such a change would also make the NCUA's policies consistent with the other federal financial regulators, which do not have similarly prescriptive requirements and also would make us comply with generally accepted accounting principles as well. This rule would not undermine important consumer protections. Credit unions already place a high value on consumer protection for their members, and the adjustment to the overdraft policy is consistent with credit unions' long tradition of providing their member owners with quality, affordable financial products and services. Credit unions will continue to serve their members now as they have since their inception. A recent study by NCUA found that 30-year mortgage rates were generally lower for credit union-originated loans than for mortgages originated by other financial services providers. Also, NCUA's most recent quarterly report on depository interest rates suggested that credit unions' auto loan rates, both for new and used vehicles, generally remain well below rates offered by other financial services providers. Capping overdraft fees could have a deleterious impact on credit unions economically and operationally. If a credit union cannot charge an amount that is sufficient to recover costs, the credit union would have to offer the product at a loss to the institution or simply not offer the product at all. This logic is similar as to why the PALS loans have a higher interest rate. Offering it at a loss would mean the credit union would have to make up earnings elsewhere through higher fees on other products and services or lower dividend rates and so on. As long as credit unions are properly disclosing, are properly disclosing fees and prices so that members can make informed decisions, I think that allowing credit unions to operate in the marketplace and price their products and services accordingly, it ensures that they are able to provide these necessary products and services to meet member needs in a safe and sound manner. I have no questions. I'd now like to turn the floor over to Board Member Harper. Thank you for your presentations, uh, Ian and Scott, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for this time. While I appreciate the staff efforts spent on this matter, I could not support the proposed rule on overdraft policies in May, and I cannot support it now. In my view, the NCUA is missing a real opportunity to provide credit union members who are suffering because of this financial crisis with some substantive relief. In considering this matter, we ought to listen to the consumer advocates like the Center for Responsible Lending, Self-Help Federal Credit Union, Self-Help Credit Union, and the National Consumer Law Center. In their June 10, 2020 letter to us, they lay out the simple truth about this policy change. Quote, the proposal fails to offer members relief from overdraft fees so desperately needed during the COVID-19 crisis while subjecting members to additional risks from overdraft programs. Unquote. Specifically, they note that the overdraft fee practices of many federal credit unions are fundamentally detrimental to members and inconsistent with the very definition of federal credit union in the Federal Credit Union Act, a cooperative association organized for the purpose of promoting thrift among its members and creating a source of credit for provident and productive purposes. Rather than promote sound financial management, so-called courtesy overdraft fee programs undermine it. Rather than provide credit for provident or productive purposes, these overdraft fee programs 
make it harder for members to regain their financial footing or kick them off the ladder altogether. I very much agree with their analysis. What is more, those households hardest hit by the persistent overdraft fees often have their checking accounts closed. That makes it difficult to reenter the financial services mainstream. And Black and Hispanic consumers are disproportionately harmed by overdraft fees. Thus, the reality is, is that overdraft programs are products of financial exclusion, not financial inclusion. Since the start of the pandemic, American workers have filed more than 90 million unemployment claims, including nearly another 900,000 today. And we know that women and people of color have been more likely to lose their jobs. As of the end of November, the national unemployment rate was 6.7%. That rate was disproportionately higher for Black and Hispanic workers. The pain is real for these communities. Millions upon millions of households are suffering in this economic crisis. The NCUA board should have used this opportunity to take bold action to help those credit union members in need. We should have worked to provide them with a safety net and put them on a firmer financial foundation for the future. We could have done things like protecting credit union members from the repayment of negative balances through a single balloon payment from the next deposit. We could have done things like prohibiting sustained or extended overdraft fees. We could have done things like requiring overdraft fees to be reasonable and proportional to the cost to the credit union, or we could have done things like limiting the number of fees charged per year or per month. The NCUA board should have taken any of these steps to shield households from the escalating economic fallout of the pandemic and provide relief from overdraft programs. Instead, we are taking actions to benefit credit unions over their members. Credit unions should be offering members an amortizing loan to clear the negative balance, undoubtedly the, in the better interest of the member, sooner rather than later. But by extending the time rate frame for negative balance resolution beyond 45 days, the proposed rule before the board today would lengthen the period for which a credit union can maintain its effective super lean position over its members. And under this proposal, credit unions will be allowed to charge off the overdraft after about 60 days and still have the right to offset. That means the credit union can maintain its super lean and garnish its members' income to pay off the overdraft debt. During the last nine months, the NCUA has done much to protect the safety and soundness of federally insured credit unions and credit unions are participating in numerous government programs to help them stay liquid and make loans. Credit union members in return deserve to see some real relief from the NCUA. In actuality, this rulemaking does little to provide credit union members with the flexibility needed to cope with the impacts of COVID-19. Finally, as part of this proposed rule, the agency is raising questions that should have been asked and answered before issuing this proposal. Let me read just one. What specific, what specific difficulties or adverse outcomes have you encountered as a result of the 45-day time limit in 12 CFR Part 701.21 during the COVID-19? That's justification after the fact. Going forward, my hope is that the NCUA board will step up and work to help credit union members in harm's way, not just credit unions. In my view, it is unacceptable to use this crisis as an excuse for financial deregulation. For all of the policy reasons I have laid out, I will again oppose this proposed rule. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further comments. Thank you, Mr. Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member Haltman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start out by just commending credit unions in general for their efforts at financial literacy. They've done a lot in that. Because I do agree with Board Member Harper that the, the best thing for any member is to avoid an overdraft situation in the first place. But of course, that isn't always possible, uh, especially in a situation like we ha have right now with the economic downturn. This rule does give credit unions flexibility to do what they do best, find ways to compete with other financial institutions 
find innovative solutions, some of which will allow people to leave institutions that charge excessive fees. And lastly, um, Chairman Hood mentioned trying to get people away from payday lenders and, and very uh, l loans that have very difficult rates, difficult parameters, et cetera. I'd just like to say this. The highest rate I've ever been charged in my life uh, comes from government, and we see this all the time. My, just as an example, and I can show you this bill if you like, uh, I owe my state government $190 for a business license, just for a rental property, $190, 190 If I am one day late, I owe 440 If I am 30 days late, I owe 690 That's 30 days late, I owe 690 on a $190 fee I have to pay. That is from my state government. So one thing I, that this rule may do is give flexibility to allow people to escape those kind of charges that governments and others often apply. I have no further comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Before we take a vote, I would like to just acknowledge the great work that our credit unions are doing each and every day to really help their member owners during this challenging environment. I've seen that manifest itself through the 1.7 million loan forbearances that the credit unions have granted for some $55 billion. Almost 50% of our credit unions have offered some form or fashion of a forbearance. I'd also like to recognize those credit unions that are providing alternatives to pernicious payday lenders. There are some that are using our payday alternative loan product. In fact, over 130,000 PALS loans have been made to help those low to moderate income consumers or member owners have access to short-term credit. In addition, there are other 1,000 credit unions that are offering micro-consumer loans for an average loan size of $500. So I do want to thank our credit unions. We recognize that you've stepped up to the plate to really offer your tools and guidance to your member owners. It's not lost on me, you all, that credit unions grew out of adversity. We grew out of the Great Depression when hardworking men and women could not have access to Main Street banking finance. What did they do? They galvanized and marshaled their resources to create today's system of cooperative credit, continuing to embody people helping people. So when credit unions are offering tools, whether it be overdraft or PALS or alternatives or things, whatever the case may be, credit unions have demonstrated for nearly a century the ability to look after their members and do what's best for their member owners. With that being said, I'd like to ask, is there a motion? I move that the board approve proposed rule, part 701 of NCUA's rules and regulations. Make sure I'm the right one here. Uh, as for for a 30-day comment period as attached to the board action memorandum. Did I read the right one there? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> second. Hearing none, I second the motion. There is now a sufficient second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Nay. Thank you. Let the record show the motion passed two to one. Thank you. The fifth item on our agenda today is Final Rule Part 701, 702, 709, and 741, Subordinated Debt. Staff presenting, Myra Tepe, Director, Examination and Insurance, Owen Cole, Associate Director, Tom Fay, Capital Markets Manager, Rick Mayfield, Senior Capital Market Specialist, all from the Office of Examination and Insurance, and Justin Anderson, Senior Staff Attorney from the Office of the General Counsel. Good morning and welcome to you all. Good morning, Chairman Hood. This is Owen Cole. I'll start our presentation this morning. Uh, good morning, Chairman Hood, Board Member Harper, and a special uh, uh, hello to Board Member Houtman. Welcome to NCUA. We are here to present for your approval a final rule addressing subordinated debt authority for natural person credit unions. The board issued a proposed subordinated rule at its January 23rd, 2020 meeting, amending various parts of NCUA's regulations to permit low income designated credit unions, complex credit unions, and new credit unions 
to issue subordinated debt for purposes of regulatory capital treatment. The comment period for the proposed rule closed on July the 8th of this year. Justin will present a summary of those NPR comments that we received following my remarks. And in turn, Tom will discuss the recommended changes resulting from staff's deliberation of those comments and how we incorporated this input into this recommended final rule. Consistent with the initial proposal, the final rule retains the original intent to maintain the authority of low-income designated credit unions, or LICUs, to accept secondary capital while further expanding authority for certain qualifying non-LICUs to also be permitted to issue subordinated debt instruments and have them count as capital for risk-based capital compliance purposes. And lastly, for new credit unions to issue subordinated debt. If approved, the effective date of this final rule will coincide with the effective date of the final risk-based capital rule scheduled for January 1st, 2022. In finalizing this rule, we've maintained our key objectives from the January proposed rule. First, we wanted to incorporate the lessons learned from overseeing the current secondary capital framework. Second, we wanted to extend responsible regulatory relief where possible. Third, we made necessary revisions and clarifications to the current secondary capital regulation. And lastly, we sought to consolidate all the capital-related regulations for natural person credit unions into a single place under Part 702. In summary, our aims are to reorganize and consolidate the related rules and to strike the right balance between regulatory relief that provides credit unions additional tools to manage their capital in a safe and sound manner while supporting that with prudential regulations. We also sought to provide additional clarity on the application requirements, note disclosures, and investor protections that provide a more clear and transparent framework for both the issuer and the investor. I will now hand things over to Justin Anderson, who will provide an overview of the comments received on the proposed rule. Justin. Thank you, Alan. I will provide a high-level overview of the comments received on the proposed rule. In total, the NCUA received 171 comments from a variety of sources, including credit unions, trade associations, leagues, law firms, brokers, and insurance providers. Of the 171 comments, 121, 125 of them were based on a single form letter. This form letter and the derivations thereof all opposed the proposed rule in its entirety. The majority of the substantive letters the agency received were in favor of the proposed rule, but all suggested at least one change or clarification. After review of all of the requested changes and all of the comments, staff is recommending several amendments in the final rule, which I will now hand it over to Tom to discuss. Tom? Thank you, Justin, and good morning, all. As Justin just stated, staff are recommending four changes to the January proposal as part of this final rule. First, as noted in the preamble to the proposed rule at the time, the SEC had proposed amendments to the definition of accredited investor. The SEC has now finalized these amendments. These changes, which were effective December 8, 2020, expand the definition of accredited investor by adding several new categories of natural persons or entities the SEC considers accredited investors. Adopting these changes to the definition of the accredited investor modifies the definitions in our entity and natural person accredited investor for this rule. The second change we made, we are clarifying the territorial limitations. Not changing, but just clarifying the territorial limitations as part of the requirements related to the offer, sale, and issuance of subordinated debt. An issuing credit union may only offer, issue, and sell subordinated debt notes in the United States of America, including any one of the states thereof and the District of Columbia, its territories, and its possessions. This limitation includes 
a prohibition on non-U.S. investors holding or purchasing subordinated debt notes. The third change we, we are recommending is reducing the minimum number of years for the pro forma financial statement requirement, which is part of the initial application, and we'd like to propose to move that from five years to two years for the final rule. We believe a reduction in the number of years from the proposed five to two years is appropriate and will provide, in most cases, the necessary information to render a decision on the initial application. And lastly, the proposed rule includes a provision that would require the expiration of an issuing credit union's authority to issue subordinated debt notes one year from the approval date. We understand that business and or economic conditions can change rapidly, as has occurred this year with the global pandemic, and that a credit union may need a longer period to meet its strategic goals using subordinated debt. After thorough consideration, we recommend increasing the expiration period to two years from the current one year and retain that provision that allows an issuing credit union to file a written request for one or more extensions of the two-year limit with the appropriate supervision office, provided the request is filed at least 30 days before the expiration of the authority. That concludes our part of the presentation on the changes to the final rule, but there is one noteworthy item I'd like to speak to. As Owen previously mentioned, the effective date of this final rule is January 1, 2022, just over one year from today. During 2021, any secondary capital applications by credit unions that are approved must also be fully issued by December 31, 2021. And if not, the approval or unissued amount will expire and thus subject to the requirements of this final subordinated debt rule. In conclusion, we believe this final rule will provide responsible regulatory relief, improve the prudential framework for subordinated debt, and better organize the rules related to subordinated debt. This concludes our prepared remarks. We'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Great. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Owen, Justin, and Tom for your presentation. And I also welcome Myron and Rick. I clearly and certainly appreciate the hard work that went into this final rule, including your analysis of the comments received on the proposal. I particularly enjoyed hearing those uh, when we were doing our briefings uh, in preparation for today's meeting. For years, the NCRA has been considering how to create a regulatory environment so credit unions are able to utilize alternative forms of capital, such as secondary and supplemental capital and subordinated debt. I would like to, at this time, recognize, applaud, and thank Chairwoman Debbie Mass because it was she in December 2014 that created a secondary capital working group to consider ideas for raising the value of secondary capital for low-income credit unions. In 2015, NCA revised the supervisory practices outlined in the agency's National Supervision Policy Manual making it easier for low-income credit unions to obtain supplemental capital and providing investors with greater clarity and confidence. The board also held a public briefing on this issue of alternative forms of capital at its October 2016 meeting. The board approved and issued an ANPR on alternative forms of capital at its January 2017 meeting. And on January 23rd of this year, 2020, the NCRA board unanimously approved a proposed rule updating its regulations to allow credit unions to issue subordinated debt for regulatory capital standards. As I said back in January, many low-income designated credit unions or like use and other financial institutions have a record of prudently using subordinated debt to increase regulatory capital levels to protect against future losses. Of the credit unions we oversee now, about half are low-income designated. Congress provided federal credit unions with the authority to borrow from any source. Federal credit unions borrowing in the form of subordinated debt is squarely within the statutory authority provided under the law. I indeed support giving complex credit unions the authority to prudently use subordinated debt as an additional tool to comply with risk-based capital requirements and newly chartered credit unions the ability to use this tool to get up and running with alacrity. 
I'm pleased with the balance we struck with this final rule. While it's true we've expanded the potential use of subordinated debt to include non-low-income designated credit unions that are characterized as complex for regulatory capital purposes and new credit unions, I want to reiterate that this does not change the ability of LICUs to issue and count subordinated debt for net worth purposes as provided for in the Federal Credit Union Act. In addition, this final rule provides more clarity and transparency to credit unions about NCUA's issuance standards and what is needed to complete an application and meet our approval criteria than it, it then is in the current secondary capital rule. Not only will this move the path for credit unions seeking NCUA's approval, but it will also benefit investors in a way that should increase the liquidity and marketability of subordinated debt over time. This final rule also includes prudential safeguards for credit unions, investors, and the share insurance fund while remaining mindful of issuances by like use. By improving transparency, liquidity, and marketability, we can reasonably expect to lower the relative cost of subordinated debt. And by lowering this cost and increasing the efficiency of their capital, credit unions can pass that along to their members in the form of more affordable and diversified financial services. We've done other things to improve the potential depth of a market for subordinated debt. We expanded the potential investors of credit union subordinated debt to include natural persons, which is an expansion from the current secondary capital rule that restricts investors to only those that are institutions. We've also added flexibility for multiple issuances without the need to reapply, added flexibility on repayment terms, and flexibility to retain outstanding subordinated debt through a merger or dissolution. And lastly, we provided additional safe harbors for repudiation and interest payments. As I have frequently stated, we welcome stakeholder comments and are very judicious in how we synthesize them and put them into final rules, and this was no exception. The comments we received were indeed helpful and influenced our analysis by providing the basis for some of the changes made to our initial proposal as Tom highlighted in his remarks this morning. Overall, I believe this rule ensures that we have the appropriate due diligence safeguards and investor protections in place. The specificity in this rule affords a roadmap for pre-approval requirements. Again, this provides transparency and clarity around what the NCRA requires for disclosures and offering materials necessary for credit unions issuing subordinated debt. This will help qualifying credit unions in both their application and issuance efforts by aiding credit unions in creating disclosures and offering materials required for the issuance of subordinated debt and provide investors the protections and disclosures they are accustomed to receiving from banks and other entities issuing subordinated debt. Finally, it is important to reiterate that the authorities in this rule remain firmly rooted in the authorities Congress granted to federal credit unions and the board. As articulated in both the proposed and final subordinated debt rules, the Federal Credit Union Act permits federal credit unions to borrow from any source and permits the NCUA board to design a risk-based standard that takes account of any material risk against which the net worth ratio required for an insured credit, insured credit union to be adequately capitalized may not provide adequate protection. This rule stays true to both of those authorities while providing credit unions with an additional tool to manage their risk-based capital ratios. In summary, I support giving complex credit unions that aren't low-income designated the additional authority to prudently use subordinated debt as a tool to comply with risk-based capital requirements and newly chartered credit unions the ability to use this tool to get up and running. At the same time, it is essential the NCUA have prudential safeguards and a sound supervisory framework for subordinated debt in place, including relevant specialized staff. It is equally important to have strong investor protections, in particular with respect to suitability requirements and disclosures, which is why I'm pleased to have in this final rule the provisions that only address the issuer, but the investor as well. I now have a few questions. First, 
understand that we've modeled the primary tenets of this rule from other banking agencies' policies and, policies and procedures. Can you explain more about this, please? Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is Owen Cole. Uh, I can respond to your question. The OCC has had a subordinated debt framework in place for a number of years now, and we've considered their regulation as well as the information from their licensing manual in confirming that we've addressed all the major aspects of a subordinated debt program in our own rule, including eligibility, disclosures, uh, application for approval, prepayments, uh, and, and other topics. We acknowledge that the rule is more prescriptive in these areas, but emphasize that our approach is designed to provide a strong initial prudential framework for credit unions within which to issue subordinated debt safely. This concludes my answer. Thank you, Owen. We increase the scope of this rule to complex credit unions who are not like yous. What benefits would a non like you have by issuing subordinated debt? Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is Rick Mayfield, and I will be taking this question. Complex credit unions that are not like yous that issue subordinated debt will be allowed to count subordinated debt in their risk based capital numerator. This ability will be helpful if the risk based capital ratio is the binding constraint when determining a complex credit union's class, capital classification. One other benefit beyond complex credit unions is for new credit unions. A new credit union would not be subject to mandatory and discretionary actions under PCA if the new credit union has outstanding subordinated debt that would be treated as regulatory capital if the credit union were a LIQ or complex credit union if two conditions are met. Number one, the ratio of the new credit union's net worth with the subordinated debt to its total assets would exceed 7%. And number two, the new credit union's net worth is increasing in a manner consistent with the new credit union's approved initial business plan or the revised business plan. This concludes my answer. Great, thank you, Rick. And I do have just one final question. I want to confirm the approach for filing fees. We will not impose a filing fee at the reception of the rule, but the board has an option, if it should agree to do so, to impose a fee at some point in the future. Can you please elaborate, one of you? Chairman Hood, this is Justin Anderson, and I'll be taking this question. And yes, you are correct. The rule does not directly impose a fee uh, at its inception, but it does retain the ability for the board to impose a fee at a later date should the board determine that a fee is necessary. This concludes my answer. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Justin. And I have no further questions. I just want to thank you all for your thoughtful answers and careful preparation for today. In summary, I believe this final rule will provide reasonable and responsible regulatory relief without posing undue risk to the share insurance fund, I certainly will be supporting it. I'd now like to recognize board member Harper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I share your views that this is a reasonable and responsible rule. And Owen, Myra, Rick, Tom, and Justin, thank you for your very hard work uh, over several years on this much anticipated final rule. And um, Owen, um, Thank you for your what I think is going to be your final presentation uh, before the board before you retire. I know I'm going to miss you. A well-structured regulatory system of subordinated debt will protect the credit union system from losses. It also has the potential to expand access to financial services for underserved communities. When the NCUA board considered the subordinated debt proposed rule at the start of the year, I said that capital is king. That is still true. Clarifying the ability of certain credit unions to issue subordinated debt will better protect federally insured credit unions, their members, and taxpayers from losses to the share insurance fund by creating a buffer against the capital losses caused by economic downturns, fraud, and management errors. In turn, that capital will strengthen the resilience of the system. In this final rule, we create an overarching framework 
to govern the subordinated debt issued by low-income credit unions, complex credit unions, new credit unions, and credit unions anticipating becoming complex or low-income within 24 months of issuing the subordinated debt. In developing this rule, staff has also constructed a workable and appropriate regulatory structure that will well serve the credit unions compromising 91% of the system's assets. With appropriate guardrails in place, a number of low-income credit unions have prudently used secondary capital, a form of subordinated debt, for many years. This secondary capital has increased regulatory capital levels to protect against future losses and serve as a foundation for strategic initiatives and growth. These funds have also served as a valuable resource to some low-income credit unions, enabling them to provide much-needed lending and other member services to under-resourced communities. According to call reports, we currently have 75 credit unions issuing $349 million, in secondary $349 million in secondary capital. Because these issuances support efforts to advance economic equality and justice around the country, my first guiding principle in considering this rule was to ensure that we did no harm to those low-income credit unions that are intensely focused on serving communities of color and people in need. In other words, I want to preserve low-income credit unions' access to secondary capital. During this rulemaking, some stakeholders have expressed apprehension that this regulation will hamper the efforts of smaller community development credit unions to obtain modest amounts of secondary capital. Inclusive, a group dedicated to organizing, supporting, and investing in community development credit unions noted in its comment letter that it has supported efforts to originate secondary capital loans of as little as $7,500. By voting today, I want to ensure that this final rule will neither cut off that capital pipeline nor make it cost prohibitive to access small amounts of secondary capital. In that regard, Tom, will you explain for us how this final rule will not preclude a small, low-income credit union from proceeding with a small-scale, bilateral issuance as the current secondary capital rule permits. Uh, good morning, Board Member Harper. This is Owen Cole. Um, and oh, you're I, gonna I, take can answer, okay. I can answer that question. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Todd, for the acknowledgement. Um, it, it is true. There, there is some anxiety about how changes to this rule might change the process for low-income credit unions, and especially smaller institutions. And we know this as a result of both the NPR comments and from important stakeholder discussions throughout the rulemaking process. There are several, <clears throat> excuse me, there are several considerations that we believe should alleviate the concern that issuing subordinated debt under this proposed final rule would somehow be cost prohibitive to these smaller credit unions. One, the, the current small issuances that have historically typified transactions yeah. in the space are, are expected to continue. And for example, as you mentioned, a bilateral placement between a, a like you and a philanthropic organization or between a like you and a larger banking in this institution seeking to support its CRA objectives, those are still permissible under this rule. Two, uh, while it's true, we, we have bolstered the pre-approval requirements, much of it now codified in the rule for clarity purposes, we believe this will add important transparency. And we understand that those, uh, the disclosures and the offering document requirements may be initially intimidating, uh, but there's a lot of standardization in the documents of practice, and we expect to see good levels of support from third parties to make this process repeatable and, and more efficient over time and without the same level of effort as the initial pursuit requires. And then finally, we think that establishing these market standard requirements will reap material benefits for credit union issuers in the long run by creating the roadmap, as we term it, for what we hope is successful and sustainable debt issuance that the market views as being stable, predictable, and liquid. And uh, that concludes my answer. Thank you. 
Owen, thank you very much for those reassurances. I have also heard concerns from community development credit unions about incorporating secondary capital into a subordinated debt structure that must comply with applicable securities laws. Some have said a small, low-income credit union might forego issuing secondary capital given the costs of hiring a securities lawyer to prepare disclosure documents. In that regard, what new compliance requirements are we actually imposing on credit unions related to securities law, and is this necessary? Board Member Harper, this is Justin Anderson, and I will respond to your question. The rule impl imposes a new offering document requirement. Um, this is the largest requirement um, that is new to this rule. The offering document must be submitted to the NCOA for approval, but only when the credit union is issuing subordinated debt to natural person investors. If a credit union is issuing subordinated debt to strictly entities, uh, then we the agency would only need to see the offering document after the issuance. Um, the offering document will provide investors with information necessary to make an informed decision, and the offering document may also help credit unions avoid violations of anti-fraud uh, laws and regulations. This concludes my answer. Thank you. And, and, and it is necessary to have those anti-fraud disclosures, correct, Justin? That, that is correct. Um, you know, as secondary capital and subordinated debt use the same instrument, uh, they would both be subject to the same anti-fraud uh, laws and regulations. Okay. Um, that is good to know. Uh, Owen, uh, following up on a part of your answer earlier, and comparing the current processes to the the current process to the final rule, what do you believe will be the increased time and resources for low income credit union applicants? And could the industry develop standardized securities disclosures to facilitate access to secondary capital under this new rule? Hi, Board Member Harper. This, again, I'm sorry, this is Tom Fay, and I'll respond to that hey, Tom. question. <laughs> Uh, Thanks, Tom. You know, we, we believe that um, much of the requirements set forth in this rule are, are largely clarifications uh, on, on expectations of what a credit union should submit uh, as part of its application for this authority. And with that, you know, we've also clarified in detail the requirements for the subordinated note itself, uh, including the restrictions and the covenants uh, that should be attached to the note. And lastly, what disclosures should be presented on the note? Yeah. So I go back to a term that Owen used previously as creating the roadmap. Um, and so we believe that the industry and those associated service providers will absorb the work and standardize this process over time. That, include, that concludes my answer, and thank you. Um, thank you, Tom. That response gives me hope that while there will be, will be some short-term disruptions in adjusting to the new system, small community development credit unions in the long term will still be able to access the secondary capital that they need to best serve their members. The agency needs to monitor this rule's implementation to ensure that result, and I, I hope that, Myra, you and your team plan to work on that. Finally, it occurs to me that pooling subordinated debt may be a good way to help smaller credit unions with their issuances. Pooling could also create a diversified portfolio of assets that may be more attractive to investors. Tom, will this final rule allow for pooling? Member Harper, this is Rick Mayfield, and I'll actually answer uh, this Rick, question. I, I have not gotten anybody right on asking the question today. <laughs> um, better luck next time. <laughs> so, um, Subordinated debt issuances could be pooled since there is no prohibition in the final rule um, on subordinated yeah. debt that that um, against um, subordinated debt being pooled and sold to investors. So there is no prohibition against it. However, any such pooling would need to comply with the applicable securities law, and the subordinated sure. debt in the pool would need to comply with NCUA regulations. And okay. that's basically the standards that we would go by. And that concludes my answer, and thank you.
Okay, so so what I'm hearing from you, Rick, is that it is permissible, uh, but the hoops would have to be jumped through in order to make it happen. Absolutely. It would have to be comply with uh, SEC um, rules and regulations or, or securities laws and would also have to comply with our subordinated debt rules and other right. potential rules that might apply. Good. That is helpful information. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your answers to my questions. In considering this final rule, another principle guided my decision, the need to maintain the mutual, cooperative, one-person, one-vote structure of the credit union system. The introduction of funds into complex credit unions from parties outside of the credit union system has the potential to undermine the basis for the federal tax exemption. Preserve the cooperative structure of the credit union system, this final rule appropriately limits the outside funding to debt. In doing so, we are protecting against the erosion of the mutual structure of the credit union system. The purchasers of the debt will lack voting rights and ownership in the issuing credit union. Moreover, the final rules provisions will prohibit negative covenants to ensure that investors in subordinated debt cannot interfere with the operation of the credit union or impose conditions that will affect the safety and soundness of the credit union or the NCUA's authority as a regulator and insurer. These are important safeguards. Investor protection was the final principle on my mind when reviewing this regulation. This rule expands who can purchase subordinated debt from certain institutions to a broader group of investors, including natural persons who meet certain tests. Subordinated debt has real risk attached to it. In the best case, investors can expect a steady stream of income for a period of time. In the worst case, investors may lose their entire investment. We therefore need to provide the investors in subordinated debt with appropriate disclosures so that they can better understand the risk. To address my concerns about investor protection, the final rule requires strong, clear disclosures. To protect elderly retirees, among others, staff have worked to ensure that the disclosures provided with any subordinated debt issuance will be transparent, accurate, and verifiable. And these disclosures will be absolutely clear that the subordinated debt product is not federally insured. Finally, and briefly, three other aspects of the rule merit discussion details. First, in preventing a credit union that issues subordinated debt from purchasing the subordinated debt of other credit unions, the final rule protects against loss transmission that could occur if one credit union fails. As we know far too well from the domino effect during the corporate credit union crisis, the downstream consequences of a failure at one institution have the potential to magnify and grow if not properly abated in advance through sound regulatory policy. Second, in terms of the NCUA's approval process, I like that this final rule preserves the ability of the agency to ask for additional information and documents when needed to assess the viability of the overall transaction. This reservation of authority is appropriate and I'm glad that staff worked to incorporate it into this final rule as I requested. Finally, I appreciate the rule's conflict of interest provisions. The regulation will prevent senior management, board members, and their immediate family members from purchasing the subordinated debt of the credit union at which they work or volunteer. The rule will also codify a prohibition on the payment of direct or indirect compensation in the form of commissions, bonuses, or similar payments to any employee of the issuing credit union or a credit union service organization that assists in the marketing and sale of the issuing credit union subordinated debt. Again, I appreciate that staff work to incorporate my ideas on this into the final rule. In closing, this final rule is an important step forward for the credit union industry. In all, this rule maintains the cooperative structure of the system and minimizes issues related to state and federal tax exemptions. It also contains appropriate guardrails to protect credit unions, investors, 
and taxpayers. Ultimately, this well-considered responsible final rule has the potential to positively transform the credit union system and industry over the long term. The final rule is a good one, and I will support it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Board Member Harper. I now would like to recognize Board Member Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have uh, one question for the staff, and for that matter, uh, to the other board members, and it's whether NCUA could or should engage in any efforts to make the investing world at least aware this debt exists and that more of it may be issued in the years to come as a result of this rule. Now, I want to say it's obviously not NCUA's place to recommend investments to anyone, and nor is it appropriate for NCUA to ensure that credit unions issue debt at any particular interest rate. Uh, those matters are clearly left to the issuers and buyers of the debt. But the reason I ask is that if this rule results in additional supply of this debt in the market, then unless equivalent demand is found, the price of this capital is going to be higher than it would otherwise. At the moment, there's something of a niche market uh, for investors in this kind of paper. So I ask you guys, uh, are there ideas for ways to NCUA to let possible investors know this paper exists and to get them comfortable with what exactly the paper is? So, Board Member Hoffman, this is... Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Please, please, please go ahead. No, no, no. You please go ahead. I, I was just going to say, um, respond briefly to, to your question, but also your comment about... Uh, the uh, aspiration to, to lower the cost of these issuances for institutions. And we, uh, we agree that if we can get standardization and, and the market's view of this as a, as a conventional uh, and additional alternative, that that should help pricing and liquidity and accrue to the benefits of the credit unions, and they can pass that on to their members. And we see that as an important public policy uh, objective here. With regard to uh, communicating uh, and raising awareness about uh, the availability of secondary, uh, excuse me, of subordinated debt issuances, um, our, our role traditionally has been to avail ourselves to uh, help uh, facilitate an understanding about what are NCUA supervisory expectations, uh, how will we view applications and monitor this activity uh, over the course of its uh, issuance, and certainly to make sure that there are no uh, uh, questions or confusions among investors or credit unions about uh, why it's uh, safe and sound and uh, regulated with uh, appropriate safeguards. And But as you said, we're, our role is not specifically to, to advocate or to suggest to an investor that they should buy it, uh, but, but to put a lot of transparency around these transactions and make sure that investor uh, understanding and confidence is as good as it can be, and, and, and we're prepared to do that. So thank you for your question. All right, I, I appreciate that. Um, let me just ask it another way. I know some of the current buyers in the current smaller market for this are some foundations, et cetera, who know about this paper, are comfortable with it, and it fits their obje ob investing uh, objectives. Do we think, and anybody can answer this, that there are other buckets of money out there for whom this may be appropriate that don't know, A, what it is, or B, that we are doing this rule, therefore more supply will be out there in the years to come. So board member Hauptman, this is Rick Mayfield. Um, so we don't know who knows um, whether or not this is gonna be out there, but we do know that with the current rule that if LICU's issue, they can get, um, the buyer can get CRA. So we believe there might be a natural market for uh, banks and insurance companies to buy the, the subordinated debt from LICUs for CRA credits. But, um, you know, it, it's hard to say 
um, or it's ha hard for us to actually um, determine who knows what out there. Um, I'm sure that with bigger issues, issues the uh, brokerage community will actually uh, do part of that education too to get this out there and get the word out to investors. That can gotcha. be my remar remarks. Gotcha. Um, as you know, it, a large debt issuer, you know, if you were Ford Motor Company or something, there might be a roadshow to investors and you'd have a syndicate that would help put it together and, and uh, you know, make a book for it. I, I know we're not at that level, nor do we intend to be. Um, but I do think we owe the credit unions a way. Um, we owe them a way to be able to tell them that we have done everything we can to let every possible investor know that this exists. I don't mean, you know, every household mom and pop investor, but, you know, the large pools of capital that this may be attracted to. You make an excellent point about CRA. That is kind of a built-in audience. But there is the non-CRA audience uh, that this may, may be appropriate for. But if we're going to put this rule forth, I think that um, we do owe in, in the months and years to come, we have to be able to tell them that we've done what we could to allow let people know that this stuff at least exists and get familiar um, with it. Otherwise, we'll have additional supply, not equivalent demand, and the rates will go up. Again, it's not our responsibility to insure anything. But I, it, it, that the existence of it does strike me as an effort. We don't, you're right, we don't know who knows and who don't, but we can know, uh, you know, sorry, who doesn't, but we can know what efforts NCUA has done um, to raise awareness that this paper exists and that more of it is on the way. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great, and thank you, Mr. Haltman. And you do raise a really good point. I would just also uh, suggest that as social impact investors get more engaged, especially in what we're seeing now with the uptick in their activity following the George Floyd tragedy, how they all are investing in things such as DEI. So I could easily see impact investors perhaps wanting to work with some of our minority depository institutions. I could also see with the heightened awareness of ESG investing opportunities. So there are a number of players that I think would really be ideal uh, for working with our institutions uh, with subordinated debt. So thank you. You raised some really good commentary regarding outreach and not just having this tool exist without any users for it. With that being said, is there a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is Board Member Harper, and, and this matter has been a long time coming. Uh, but I am pleased to move that the board approve final rule parts 701, 702, 709, and 741 of NCUA's rules and regulations as attached to the board action memorandum. Is there a second to the motion? I second the motion. There is a sufficient second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and let the record show the motion passed three to zero. And I agree with Mr. Harper that this has been a long time coming. In fact, I dare say that, Mr. Harper, you were likely here when Chairwoman Met made this a priority and created that working group uh, in 2014. So it's been, what, six years in the making, but delighted yes. to see it come to fruition today. So I agree with Indeed. you wholeheartedly. <laughs> Indeed. Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Mr. Hatman. If I could add one thing, I probably should have said earlier, which is um, that one of our one of my goals here is to make it easier to create new charters for credit unions. There is nothing better than taking your business to someone who appreciates it. Um, and this tool, this rule we just passed, maybe could make the process easier and quicker for new credit union charters. It shouldn't take six years like it did up in Maine uh, to start a new one. So anyway, I just want to add that one of the benefits possibly is uh, new credit union charters, and that is certainly a goal of mine. And I know you guys uh, appreciate that goal as well, and you've mentioned it uh, as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Mr. Hoffman. One of my proudest moments is that early upon arriving at the agency last year was going out to Oklahoma City with our very own Owen Cole, where we presented the Auto Missouri Federal Credit Union with their charter. So, yes, we certainly want to see de novo credit unions in the days ahead. So now, ladies and gentlemen, 
I'd like to turn our attention to our sixth and final item on our agenda today, which is a board briefing regarding the Share Insurance Fund 2021 Normal Operating Level. Staff presenting, Myra Tepe, Director, Victoria Narwhal, Acting Associate Director, Russell Moore, Risk Officer, Office of Examination and Insurance, along with Kevin Taninga, Associate General Counsel, Office of General Counsel, and Andrew Leventus, Chief Economist. Good morning and welcome to all of you. Um, good morning, Chairman Hood, Board Member Harper, and Board Member Hopman. This is Myra Tepe, Director of the Office of Examination and Insurance. We are here today to brief the NCUA Board regarding the results of the normal operating level calculation for 2021. Based on the board approved methodology, the normal operating level calculates as 1.39%. However, we, are recommend, we recommend keeping the normal operating level at 1.38% for 2021. We will provide you with additional details in a few moments about the calculation and our recommendation. However, before we do that, we will discuss the statutory criteria for the normal operating level and the objectives of the board's policy for setting the normal operating level. Finally, we will conclude with a summary of next steps. I will now turn the presentation over to Russell Moore to discuss the statutory criteria, policy, and results of our analysis. Thank you, Myra. This is uh, Risk Officer Russell Moore. Uh, could we go to slide two, please? The normal operating level represents the target equity ratio for the share insurance fund and is the point at which excess equity is returned to credit unions. The act requires the board to set the normal operating level from 1.20% to 1.50%. I would like to emphasize a few of the statutory criteria. If the equity ratio falls below 1.20%, the Act mandates the board must assess a premium to restore the fund to at least 1.20%. The timing of the premium is based on the fund restoration plan that is required to be established and implemented by the NCUA board within 90 days. The NCUA board may not assess a premium if the equity ratio exceeds 1.30%. Therefore, even though the equity ratio could go as high as 1.50%, it can only grow above 1.30% through earnings and not premiums. Regarding distributions, the calendar year-end equity, uh, equity ratio of the fund is the one of the primary basis for determining whether a distribution to credit unions is required. Specifically, if the year-end equity ratio exceeds the normal operating level, any loans and associated interest to the fund from the federal government have been repaid, and the fund's available assets ratio exceeds 1.0%, then the UNCA board must return the excess to credit unions. The normal operating level was last set at 1.38% in December 2019 based on the policy adopted by the board at its September 2017 meeting. Next slide, please. In approving the policy for setting the normal operating level, the board stated three specific objectives. The first objective is to retain public confidence in federal share insurance. The second objective is to prevent impairment of the 1% capital deposit credit unions contribute to the fund. Finally, the third objective seeks to ensure the share insurance fund can withstand a moderate recession without the equity ratio declining below 1.20% over a five-year period. Managing to the moderate recession scenario ensures the share insurance fund retains public confidence and prevents impairment of the 1% capital deposit. Next slide, please. The agency implements the board policy through a set of calculations using contemporary data. <clears throat> the projections for 2021 use June 30th 2020 data to generate a point in time estimate based on the best information available at this time. I would note economic conditions that involve greater volatility in one or more market indicators as compared to the stress scenario modeled can lead to different outcomes. First, using the economic scenarios developed by the Federal Reserve as part of their work on the comprehensive capital analysis and review we model the impact of a moderate recession on the equity ratio over a five-year period. 
for the share insurance fund exposure, we look at the three primary drivers of the equity ratio, insurance losses, insured share growth, and yield on investments. We also model the share insurance fund's exposure to loss on corporate asset management estate claims under a moderate recession. And finally, we factor in any equity ratio decline through the end of 2021, even without an economic downturn. This final factor is to account for any expected decline in the equity ratio to preserve any additional equity needed for the asset management estate claims until the corporate legacy assets are sold and the associated risk is removed. Next slide, please. NCUA's five-year performance projections for a moderate recession have been based on the Federal Reserve's adverse scenario. We do feel it's relevant to note the Federal Reserve did not publish an adverse scenario in 2020. Therefore, it was necessary to develop the adverse scenario by using the midpoint of the Federal Reserve's base and severely adverse scenarios. Historically, this midpoint has proven to be a reasonable proxy for the adverse scenario. Next slide, please. The UNCA guaranteed notes will mature in 2021 and the associated corporate asset management estates liquidated. While there is risk associated with the corporate asset management estates in 2021, this factor will be immaterial going forward. As noted earlier, we factor in any share insurance fund equity ratio decline through the end of the following year, 2021 in the current scenario, even without an economic downturn. And the purpose of this factor is to provide extra protection to address the time it might take to liquidate the corporate asset management estates. With the corporate asset management state so close to liquidation, the original intent of this factor may no longer be necessary. I will now turn the presentation over to Vicki Narwald to discuss our options. Thank you. This is Vicki Narwald. Slide seven includes the range of options we recommend the board consider. Given the factors discussed, options include Option A would be to set the normal operating level using all three risk factors as outlined in policy. Option B would be to set the normal operating level using only the modeled performance of the share insurance fund over a five-year period under a moderate recession and the potential decline in the value of the share insurance fund's claims on the corporate asset estates, and option C would be to leave the normal operating level unchanged. Next slide, please. As you can see on this slide, this year's calculation A resulted in a normal operating level of 1.39 for 2021. The calculation under option B resulted in a normal operating level of 1.37 for 2021. The difference is elimination of the third risk factor, the projected unstressed equity ratio decline through December 31, 2021. It is worth noting how the individual factors have changed since last year's calculation. The exposure due to a decline in the share insurance fund's financial performance in a moderate recession over five years increased one basis point from 15 to 16 basis points. The risk associated with potential declines in the corporate asset management estates decreased from two basis points to one. Finally, the projected decline in the fund's equity ratio through the end of 2021 increased from one to two basis points. Setting the normal operating level between 1.39 and 1.37% under a moderate recession scenario meets the two policy objectives set by the board, preventing impairment of the 1% contributed capital deposit and ensuring the equity ratio does not fall 
below 1.2% in a moderate recession. As Myra noted earlier, given the factors just discussed, we believe the appropriate action is to leave the normal operating level at 1.38%. Next slide, please. As a conservative measure, in addition to analyzing the impact of a moderate recession on the equity ratio, we also model the impact of a severe recession. As this slide illustrates, a severe recession would reduce the equity ratio by an additional five basis points over the moderate recession scenario. This means that despite the deteriorating economic conditions expected under a severe recession, there would be no impairment of the 1% contributed capital deposit. Next slide, please. It is important to keep in mind these are only projections. There are unanticipated variables, such as extraordinary losses or failures in credit unions, abnormally high insured share growth, or volatile economic conditions that could skew actual results. Next slide, please. This slide outlines our next steps. The normal operating level will be published to the NCUA website following this meeting. We plan to prepare a request for comment on the current normal operating level policy for the first quarter of 2021. We will also convene a working group. The working group will consider how upcoming changes to the factors we discussed today might impact the methodology. Once the comments are received, the working group will consider potential changes to the policy to make it more contemporary. That concludes my remarks at this time. We would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, great. Well, Vicki and Russell, thank you both for your presentation this morning. And I also, Myra, just want to thank you and all that you do every day with this wonderful team that you have. I also want to thank Kevin and Andy for being available for questions. Vicki touched on a few things that I'd like to touch on as well, and that is the board's main objective, objective in setting the normal operating level. And these are the key objectives that we have. We first and foremost, we want to retain public confidence in the federal share insurance. We want to prevent impairment of the 1% contributed capital deposit. We also want to ensure the share rent fund can withstand a moderate recession without the equity ratio declining below 1.20% over a five-year period. The NCUA's approach seeks to ensure the share insurance fund can withstand a moderate recession without the need to assess premiums during the recession or recovery. This is a prudent but not unduly conservative approach given the current and reasonably foreseeable risk to the share insurance fund. The current NCRA board approved methodology for setting the normal operating level reflects sound risk management and governance practices. It is based on a quantitative and objective data-driven analysis. However, it is always healthy to take a fresh look at our policies to ensure that they remain contemporary, relevant, and impactful. I do now have a few questions regarding the 2020 normal operating level. First question, I understand the low interest rate environment has had an effect on the five-year stress projections. Can you please explain the impact? So this is Andy Levenis, Chief Economist. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Chairman. Uh, so historically, interest rates fall during a recession. During prior economic downturns, rates have sometimes fallen by several percentage points, which of course affects the income generated by SIF investments. This year, however, with rates already extremely low, the magnitude of the potential decline in rates during the stress scenario is not as significant. Because of this, the impact of the adverse scenario on SIF investment returns is somewhat less dramatic. So I'll pass it back to you, Chairman. Great, thank you, Andy. Mm -hmm. Could someone please clarify when the board may or may not charge a premium? Um, certainly, Chairman Hood, this is Myra Teppe. 
Um, the MQA board may assess a premium charge when the fund's equity ratio is less than 1.30% and the premium charge does not exceed the amount necessary to restore the equity ratio to 1.30%. The Federal Credit Union Act also limits the MQA board to charging premiums no more than twice in the calendar year. No premiums are permitted if the equity ratio equals or exceeds 1.30%. Um, when the equity ratio falls below 1.20%, a premium is required to restore the equity ratio to and maintain that ratio at 1.20%. Similarly, if the equity ratio falls below 1.20% or is projected to fall below 1.20% within six months, the NCUA board is required to establish and imp implement a fund restoration plan within 90 days. The required fund restoration plan must restore the equity ratio to 1.20% before the end of the eight-year peri eight period ending upon the implementation of the plan. That concludes my response, sir. Great. And then just to be clear then, so the NCRA board would be required to charge a premium if the equity ratio fell below 1.30%. I don't know if that's the case. And I just want to say I believe it would be preferable for credit unions not to bear the cost of a premium during a recession or a pandemic. All right. I believe Kevin is going to take this, this question. Kevin, you're on? All right, I'll go ahead and take the question. Um, um, we were going to have OGC's Kevin Taminga um, respond to this question, but the Act states that the NCUA board may assess a premium if the fund's equity ratio falls below 1.30%. A premium is not required until the equity ratio falls below 1.20%. At that time, as discussed, a premium is required to restore the equity ratio to and maintain that ratio at 1.20%. The timing of that premium is based on the fund restoration plan that is required to be established and implemented by the board within the 90 days. The required fund restoration plan must ensure the equity ratio meets or exceeds 1.20% before the end of the eight-year period beginning upon implementation of the plan. The Act also allows the board to set a longer time period if it determines is necessary due to extraordinary circumstances. That concludes my response. Great. And Mauer, I want to thank you for that clarification. And just to keep going a bit, does the NCRA board have any flexibility in when a distribution is paid to insured credit unions? Um, the, the, I don't, I, I, just go ahead. Go ahead, Vicki. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. And again, uh, for some reason, we're unable to hear Kevin. He's he's trying to respond. So this is Vicki Narwald, and, and I'll take that. Um, no, as long as all the regulatory criteria are met and the equity ratio exceeds the normal operating level, the NCUA board must affect a distribution from the fund as long as it does not reduce the equity ratio below the normal operating level or reduce the fund's available asset ratio below 1.0%. And that concludes my response, Chairman. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that response. I just have one final question for now. How does the FDIC's deposit insurance fund compare to our share insurance fund? This is Vicki Narwald, and I'm happy to take that question as well. As I discussed in September, the FDIC's insurance fund differs from the NCUA share insurance fund in a few ways. The FDIC's insurance fund is funded through risk-based premium assessments. The assessments are asset-based rather than insured share-based. The FDIC deposit insurance fund's most recent mandate was in conjunction with the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010. And the Dodd-Frank Act requires that the FDIC do the following things. One, establish a minimum designated reserve ratio, or DRR, of 1.35% of estimated insured deposits or the comparable percentage of the new assessment base, average consolidated total assets, minus average tangible equity, Two, like the NCUA, if the DRR falls below 1.35% or 
or if the FDIC projects that the DRR will, within six months, fall below 1.35%, the FDIC generally must adopt a restoration plan that provides that the deposit insurance fund will return to 1.35% within eight years. If the DRR exceeds 1.5%, the FDIC must provide a dividend to the deposit insurance fund members equal to the amount above what was necessary to maintain the DRR at 1.5%. The FDIC board may, in its sole discretion, suspend or limit the declaration of payment of dividends. And four, that FDIC fund also has no statutory cap for its equity ratio. The current long-term target set by the FDIC is 2%. In terms of what the funds are experiencing, the FDIC and NCUA both had unprecedented growth in insured deposits during the first six months of 2020 due to changes in spending during the pandemic stay-at-home orders, government policy actions in response to the pandemic, and a flight to safety. The FDIC DRR ratio at March of 2020 was 1.39% and fell to 1.3% at June 30, 2020. The 1.3% was less than the statutory minimum of 1.35%, so the FDIC approved a restoration plan on September 15, 2020 and posted it in the Federal Register for public comment. FDIC insured deposits grew 13.08% from December 31, 2019 to June 30, 2020, compared to a historical average growth rate of 4.5%. NCUA similarly experienced a decline in the equity ratio at June 30, 2020. Insured shares grew 12.95% in the first six months of 2020, compared to 5.17% during the same period in 2019, and a historical average growth rate of 4.58% for the first half of the year over the past four years. The equity ratio fell from 1.35% at December 31, 2019, to 1.22% at June 30, 2020. And that concludes my response, Chairman. Great, thank you for that very detailed response. I really appreciate it. I'd now like to recognize Board Member Harper. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Myra, Vicki, Andy, Russell, and Kevin for your informative briefing and answers today on the Share Insurance Fund's normal operating level and for underscoring the importance of maintaining a strong fund. Ensuring the shared deposits of members up to $250,000 and safeguarding the Share Insurance Fund from losses are two of our most important duties on the NCUA board. The credit union members, federally insured credit unions, and taxpayers who back the Share Insurance Fund count on us to get the normal operating level right. Without question, 2020 was a challenging year for us to estimate the normal operating level. Credit unions experienced a dramatic rise in assets and very low interest rates returned. What is more, the Federal Reserve did not publish the adverse economic scenario on which we usually base our estimate. Nevertheless, the NCUA staff performed appropriately and admirably in responding to these new realities. They made technical modifications to our economic models to account for unusual share growth and worked with in the existing policy to approximate an adverse scenario on which to calculate the normal operating level. Their work resulted in the three options outlined on slide eight. And if we could go to slide eight, I'd like to see it. One, which would maintain the current normal operating level. One, 
which would slightly increase the normal operating level using all three policy factors, and one that would slightly decrease the normal operating level by removing the projected decline of the equity ratio in 2021. Normally, my policy preference would be to choose the most conservative option. That's the right thing to do for taxpayers. That said, the difference with the staff recommended option is just one basis point. And we are already in the midst of an economic downturn. So we have no time to build the reserves needed to reach the normal operating level. Thus, I am comfortable leaving the share insurance funds normal operating level at 1.38%. As we move into 2021, I agree that we should establish a working group to review the policy decisions behind setting the normal operating level. That working group will evaluate the lessons we have learned thus far from the pandemic fallout, the options going forward to determine on which economic scenario to base the operating level, and the fact that the NCUA Guaranteed Notes Program will mature next year. In their research, the working group may identify other policy options for us to consider. In considering all of these options, the NCUA board must be transparent and invite public comment. Additionally, as I noted at, at September's briefing on the Share Insurance Fund's performance, we should begin a discussion with Congress about modifying the way in which we manage the Share Insurance Fund. Under its statute, and as Vicki just outlined, the FDIC has higher reserve requirements, greater administrative flexibility, and the ability to charge risk-based premiums in managing the deposit insurance fund. While the NCUA does not need to have identical powers to the FDIC, these policies are sensible and a better way to manage risk. And they would create a countercyclical approach that allows for the building of reserves during good times to cover losses in bad times. Before I close, I have a few questions for staff. First, I know that we've covered this matter before, but I want to build on the chairman's question and ask this question again. Yes. What is the likelihood of a premium assessment in 2021? This is Vicki Narwald. I'll take that question. Sure. The NCUA equity ratio at June 30th, 2020 was 1.22%, which was higher than the statutory minimum of 1.2%. Therefore, no premium assessment was required. Since then, insured credit unions adjusted their capitalization deposit to reflect the unprecedented share growth experienced during the first six months of 2020. You may recall the NCUA calculated the projected equity ratio for December 31, 2020 at 1.32%, including the anticipated capitalization deposits forecasted insured share growth, and equity values. Once December 31st, 2020 call report data is final, the NCUA will again calculate the actual equity ratio based on insured shares as of that date. The NCUA will also calculate the projected equity ratio for June 30th, 2021 based on December 31, 2020 insured shares. The projected equity ratio calculation will again consider forecasted insured share growth, equity values, and any anticipated capitalization deposits. The projected equity ratio analysis is partly based on a set of assumptions. Actual results are unknown and dependent upon multiple variables. A projected equity ratio below 1.2 would require a fund restoration plan. Similarly, if the actual equity ratio were to fall below 1.2%, as Myra indicated, a premium would be required at some point to restore the equity ratio to and maintain that ratio at 1.2%. The timing of that premium is based on the fund restoration plan that is required to be established and implemented by the NCUA board within 90 days. And that concludes my response. Back to you, board member Harper. 
And, and, and Vicki, I very much appreciate that detailed answer and, and, and really working through how the fund works. But um, I, I want to dive a little deeper because when we, we had our briefing, I, I think you said it in a very good way. Right now, we're anticipating at year end that the um, uh, equity ratio will be 1.32%. Is that correct? That is the projected equity ratio, correct. And, and, and because that 1.32% is above 1.3%, the, the board cannot charge a premium. That is correct. So the chances of us, based on year-end numbers, of charging a premium at the start of 2021 is next to zero. Is that correct? If the actual equity ratio is in line with the projected equity ratio, yep. that is correct. That, that, that's good. And I, I think that that will be welcome news to many credit unions. Um, I have another um, a question or a set of questions. To facilitate an economic recovery, the Federal Reserve Board has indicated that it expects to hold rates near zero for at least three more years. How will low rates affect the share insurance fund's equity ratio going forward, and what are the implications for the normal operating level? So this is uh, Andy Levena, so I'll chime in and, and answer that question. So uh, lower rates are going to have a pernicious impact on the investment returns of the SIF. Lower rates mean lower returns, which puts downward pressure on the equity ratio. Obviously, this isn't a good thing, particularly given that the equity ratio has already been under some stress as a result of strong share growth. In terms of the actual setting of the NOL, uh, as I said previously, the lower rates actually make one element of the stress scenario less stressful. So interest rates can only drop so far and the decline in investment returns that might accompany a new economic downturn just won't be as, a, as extreme as it once might have been. So sure. that includes my answer. So okay. back to you, Board Member Harper. Uh, m many thanks for that, Andy. And my no final problem. question, instead of using a moderate recession to estimate the normal operating level, what would be the benefits of using a severely adverse ratio instead? Do other federal banking agencies use severely adverse scenarios under their rules? Uh, so this is Andy. I'll, I'll chime in again and answer that. Um, yeah. So use of the severely adverse scenario, in my mind, would have two benefits. Operationally, it would be really convenient because we know that it will continue to be published, unlike the adverse scenario, which went away this year. Also, of course, from a SIF integrity perspective, using the severely adverse scenario would ensure a distribution would not occur unless we believed that the SIF could withstand a significantly more severe economic downturn. Uh, in terms of the use of the severely adverse scenario, I would note that the scenario is a critical element of the Federal, Reserve's, the Federal Reserve Board's annual evaluation of the capital adequacy of relatively large banks. It is used as sort of a stress as a stress scenario for the Fed's comprehensive capital analysis and review, also known as CCAR, and the Dodd Frank Act stress test, also known as DFAST. So that's the the end of my answer. I'll back to you, Board Member Harper. Uh, thank you, Andy. My, my takeaway from you is twofold. One is that using a, a more severe scenario would result in a more conservative estimate. Uh, for the share insurance fund, uh, helping it to protect it against uh, a, a, a multitude uh, of potential problems uh, going forward and, and better protecting the taxpayers from having to potentially uh, uh, pay out for losses or from the agency having to go back to Congress and create a stabilization fund like we did um, over a decade ago. And, and the second thing I take away from your answer is that other agencies do use in their rules uh, a severely adverse scenarios in order to help protect the financial system. Um, Andy, those were really helpful answers. I appreciate them. Mr. Chairman, I have no further comments at this time. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you, Mr. Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to say that you know, this is my first board meeting, and I've been quite impressed by the staff presentations. 
I had high expectations going into today, and, and they've been exceeded. So I just want to put that out there. <clears throat> Regarding the topic at hand, just some big picture comments. Uh, the share insurance fund's 1% semi-annual deposit true up has provided sufficient financial flexibility and resources for at least the near future. Uh, there has always been a government instinct to feel the solution to most problems is more money and power for government and less for families and businesses. N2A must remain mindful that we don't actually have money and that every dollar is the member's money and do so while never taking our eye from our true north of safety and soundness. The simple fact is that for most credit unions, NCUA is obviously a monopoly provider of its services. Credit union members can choose different financial service providers, but they can't pick a different NCUA. So much as we discuss institutions that may charge excessive fees, we at NCUA must ensure we are charging an appropriate price for the regulatory services that we provide. And I know that is a shared goal, and I have no further comments, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hopman. Before we adjourn today, I, ladies and gentlemen, would like to recognize Owen Cole, who will be retiring later this month. It gives me great pleasure to recognize Owen's more than 27 years of service to our agency and extend our heartfelt congratulations and best wishes to him as he embarks upon a well-deserved retirement. I wish we could applaud you, Owen, in person, and I hope to do that, um, but sadly we can't do it for you to see us. Owen, since you began your career in the banking industry over three decades ago to your current role as NCUA's Associate Director for Policy and Markets and the Office of Examination and Insurance, where you supervise the directors of the E&I divisions of capital markets, credit markets, policy, and NGN support, you've been a tremendous asset no pun intended, to this agency and your accomplishments have made an immeasurable and indelible impact on both the NCUA and our nation's system of cooperative credit. Further, as the president of the NCUA Central Liquidity Facility, which plays a vital role in addressing potential credit union system liquidity risk, you have diligently and assiduously worked to ensure that credit unions can continue to meet their members' needs despite the economic challenges associated with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the previous financial crisis. Your efforts in this regard have greatly benefited the credit union system as a whole. Indeed, in each of the roles you've had within our agency, including Senior Investment Officer, Director of the Division of Risk Management, Associate Regional Director of Operations, and Deputy Executive Director, you unfailingly gave your best, contributing not only your time, energy, and expertise to our agency, but also personifying hard work and dedication in support of the NCUA strategic goals. In recognition of these accomplishments, you were a well-deserving recipient of several NCUA awards, including Team of the Year in 2008, 2010, and 2013. And just last year, as my acting chief of staff when I first rejoined the agency, you helped to facilitate a regulatory environment that grows the economy by furthering agency policy and communications. I want to thank you for stepping into that role especially. I relied enormously on your wise and trusted counsel during the initial months of my chairmanship. So thank you for that role. Thank you, as I mentioned earlier, around de novo institutions for accompanying me to Oklahoma, might I add, in the middle of a tornado where we could present the Auto Missouri Federal Credit Union with their charter. Thank you for working with me side by side when we were looking for opportunities with given the CARES Act provisions to bolster the CLF, how you and I were able to do a virtual road show where we were able to present the CLF to potential investors. And through your leadership and guidance, that borrowing authority of the CLF pre-COVID of $9.5 billion now exceeds $33 billion. Owen, it goes without saying that you will be sorely missed. As I and many others throughout the NCUA have depended on your guidance and solid advice for many years, however, on this day at the agency, 
We honor you, commend your many accomplishments, and hope your retirement will be a time of discovery and fulfillment. I wish you all the best in your future endeavors, and I know you will treasure the time you will now be able to share with your family. Thank you, Owen Cole, for a life, commitment, and dedication to the NCUA and our greater credit union system. I now would like to recognize Board Member Harper to give his farewell remarks to Owen. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I wholeheartedly agree with your statement. Today, we are bidding farewell to one of the NCUA's very best, J. Owen Cole. He is the agency's senior executive pinch hitter and utility infielder, all rolled into one. Owen is also one of the calmest and nicest people I know. During his distinguished career at the NCUA, Owen has led the Office of Capital Markets and served as the longtime executive in the Office of Examination and Insurance. He has also served as Acting Chief of Staff to the Chairman, Deputy Executive Director, and President of the Central Liquidity Facility. No wonder he is retiring. A jack of all trades is an invaluable asset to an agency such as ours. And Owen, your departure will be felt for many years to come by all the staff members you led and befriended along the way. I hope that I can still call upon you to ask questions about the history of the Central Liquidity Facility. When I first joined the NCUA nearly a decade ago, Owen was one of the first people to welcome me. We bonded while discussing the details of credit union policy, current events, and bow ties. I have long appreciated his sound counsel and good guidance received during our long conversations in his office. I may have come down to discuss just a small issue, but I always left learning considerably more. Owen, thank you for your service to the NCUA and the credit union system. In your retirement, I wish you the very best. I hope that you will devote your days to doing all the things a retiree is entitled to, like reading, traveling, and spending quality time with family. I also hope that your retirement will be long, healthful, prosperous, and adventurous. It is now time to follow your dreams you long set aside and enjoy the reward of work well done. Congratulations, Owen. Mr. Chairman, I have no further comments. Thank you, Mr. Harper. And I agree wholeheartedly with everything you said. We all have really come to rely on you, Owen. And again, it's going to be really hard thinking about anything regarding CLF and all the other things that you've done with us here. Mr. Hopman, I'd like to call on you, and I recognize that although you're new to the board, I recognize that you may want to have a few closing remarks about Mr. Owen Cole. Uh, Owen, Owen, all I can tell you is relaying what I've heard, um, that the staff here is outstanding. They're first rate. When I was on the Hill, NCUA had a a good reputation, quality staff. I I said already my high expectations have, have been exceeded in the short time I've been here. And I've also heard your name in particular uh, as a big part of that. So that is obviously a uh, big hole to fill. And uh, enjoy your uh, well-earned retirement. And let's all hope that uh, your retirement activities at some point soon can include things like going to the movies or (laughs) uh, international travel and that sort of thing. So uh, Godspeed, sir. Well, thank you all. This is this is Owen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Harper, Mr. Hauptman, for those exceedingly kind remarks. Uh, it's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve NCUA and credit unions, and I certainly wish everyone all the best, and I'll, I'll miss it, and I look forward to the next phase. But thank you so much for acknowledging me here today. I, I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, it's very kind. Um, you are indeed so welcome. You. Well, Owen, you are indeed welcome, and this is not the only acknowledgement. We're going to be working with OEAC to find other opportunities to applaud and acknowledge your dedicated service. And regarding 
your retirement plans. I hope to see you when I'm up in Maine. As you know, I like to vacation in Maine most summers, and as does Mr. Haltman, with that being his home state. So you will perhaps get to see a lot of us from the NCAA board when we're in Maine. So you will hopefully, I'm hoping that we can stay in touch. With that being said, you all, that is the end of our agenda today. There being no further business, we are hereby adjourned.